Welcome to this Info Security Europe podcast. My name is Paul Mackay and I'm a senior industry analyst with uh, Forrester Research. Now, my job is a little bit of a peculiar one. It's sort of divided up into, I would say, two main areas of responsibility. One, which is the main part of my role, is to write research about security products and services markets to help clients in selecting um, the providers and the products that they need to help them with their security program. So I offer uh, documents called Forrester Waves, which um, evaluates um, the landscape of providers and help organizations choose the right provider to meet their needs. Now, that's one big part of my role, but the other part of my role is I actually spend quite a lot of time still kind of with my um, ear to the ground working with clients in advising them on some of their things. So some of the things that I do, for example, I'm working with um, some public sector organizations in the Netherlands at the moment around implementing uh, their zero trust um, framework and strategy. I often help clients understand a little bit beyond the research to get what my real view is on a company and understand what their specific needs and requirements are. So I help apply the research that I write as well. So I'm part advisor and part um, evaluator of markets and services. So it's quite a fascinating position to be in. I I essentially get paid to think because I also get allowed to do lots of crystal ball gazing and um, looking to the future and uh, helping companies uh, interpret some of the trends coming down the line. But I do this type of work for some of the security ratings firms and also security services providers like consulting firms and managed services providers, which is kind of where my background was before uh, joining Forrester three years ago. So I think the thing that really excites me about the job I do is that I almost see myself as a bit of a bridge between uh, vendors and service providers on the one hand who are obviously trying to create uh, products and services that help them meet obviously their financial objectives and also help um, secure their clients' environments. But also I'm on the other side of the bridge, listening to end users, listening to the things that they need from the service providers, and also helping them to work out some of the things that they need to do on their security programs for the areas and services that I cover. So I'm almost in this kind of like tightrope position where I have the ear of the end users and I hear the things that they need from the market, but I also have the opportunity to influence the market by pushing that feedback back into the service providers to help them with the strategies and, um, decisions they need to make around how to develop and improve their products in the future. And it's a really privileged position to be in. Um, It's it's quite unique. I don't know of any other role where you're kind of between those two worlds in quite the same way. And you're trusted by both sides to almost act as a bit of an independent arbitrator and help uh, be an honest broker between the two sides. And I I find that exposure and the um, ability to have those conversations at very senior levels within both types of organizations to be incredibly exciting and occasionally you get to deal with people like journalists as well so part of my job is also um, responding to press requests and um, going and speaking at external events and all that sort of good stuff as well but that those kind of two core elements for me and seeing um, service providers and product providers improve their products and hit the mark more with clients when I see that happening in response to feedback I've given that's really rewarding for me. So in terms of my career story into information security, it's partly um, intentional, partly accidental. So it's intentional in the sense that when I studied at St. Andrews University, I did do a very technically oriented degree. I did computer science and mathematics. I got an internship with Accenture, a major consulting firm, and then went to join them as a full-time employee uh, after I graduated. What was really kind of more accidental is that after I did my first project, I took on a role on a security a team that was part of a government account team. So they were doing lots of application development and delivery and um, new project implementations for a major UK government department. And they needed a, they had a security team that advised on all security issues um, from operational issues through to architecture issues, through to compliance and risk issues across the whole gamut of the account. So I joined that team as a security architect and by finishing the project and ending up on the new project was purely accidental. And when I started doing the work on the new project, I actually started to realize I really quite enjoyed it. So I actually kind of stayed on that account for the rest of my tenure at Accenture. And in a way that was my introduction to security. And certainly I've found the, the, the variety of the roles since then 
um, to be incredibly engaging and exciting. So I kind of came up through the consulting um, path to where I am now, but I'll talk about that more in a second. But yeah, that, that initial step was purely accidental. If I had left my first project at a different time or had had a conversation with a different project manager in Accenture, I probably wouldn't be here today sitting having this conversation with you. So I, I worked for about nine years in a very various um, security consulting uh, firm starting at Accenture and then moving into some big four firms a bit later on. But to be honest, the, the path I followed was fairly conventional after my, my start. So the, the path kind of starts at the graduate analyst level and you progress up the management chain eventually to partner or partner equivalents in uh, some of the other firms that aren't partnerships. So I guess I, I got up to senior manager level. I was quite young when I did when I did that. I was 28 when I made senior manager um, after about seven or eight years working in the workforce. Once I reached that level, um, the future career path to partnership required me to become more sales orientated and business development was really the key thing that I needed to develop. And if I'm being very truthful for myself, I'm not, it's not something I'm particularly good at and I um, didn't enjoy it very much. Um, so at that stage, I also had a young family, so the uncertainty and inherent uh, travel uh, with a consulting firm. So it's sometimes the case that you travel away from home four or five days a week, and you can be asked to do that at pretty short notice. I found it quite hard to juggle um, seeing my children and doing my job while also enabling my wife to have a, a demanding career. So she works in audit in uh, central government. So trying to juggle a two-career household with those kind of things was quite challenging for me. So I looked initially to look to go internally into a large enterprise, into an internal information security team. But actually when I discovered that Forrester were hiring for a senior analyst um, for, to oversee the European research portfolio, I thought, okay, I'll give this a try. This sounds like an interesting role. I went through the nine stage interview process, including writing a report and doing a presentation to lots of my colleagues and having that torn apart and um, been working in the role for nearly three years. Um, so still enjoying it, really, really enjoy what I'm doing now. And I expect to be here for quite a, quite a while longer. Um, so the biggest career challenge for me, I think had to, had to do with my age, um, to start with. So I, I entered Accenture at a pretty young age at like 21. Um, and I found that for the first sort of five or six years of my career, that people would look at me as somebody quite young for the positions that I had or the job titles that I had, whether I was a manager at 24 or a senior manager at 28. And people are a bit, a bit like, what the hell does he he know? He's he's too young to be able to um, add any value or tell <clears throat> tell me anything I don't all, already know. So I found that I had to work quite a bit harder um, to gain the trust of of clients, so that they could eventually see um, that I could add some value to them, and I did know what I was doing. I, I found establishing that trust because I was younger was quite challenging to start with. Once I had uh, kids a few years ago, it started to fall away a bit. I think having children has either aged me physically um, by five or six years or whoever knows. But um, I found that once I was having the discussions about schools and families that all of a sudden that started uh, going away. But certainly earlier on in my career, it was quite a challenge because I was almost seen as being, how can you be in such a position at such a young age? I've done the years of experience, but my age definitely held me back. Um, and certainly I, I found it gave me some confidence issues as well, because I sort of started to believe what they were saying as well. So it had, took a lot of like grit for me to kind of look past that and believe in myself as well, to some extent. I think the biggest thing for, for me, if you're trying to enter the industry, I think is about joining professional networking groups and getting out and talking to as many people as you can within the industry. There's plenty of conferences here in the UK, there's also events like Black Hat and MIA and also equivalents elsewhere in the uh, US if you're listening in from somewhere else that I think do sponsor um, attendance for junior professionals and many of them are actually free to attend. So I think getting into those kind of things, dipping your toe and going and speaking to people, finding out about the roles that you can do in security, because it, it is very varied. Some roles require very technical hands-on skills, others are more accessible to those without those skills. And I think understanding where you fall within the uh, spectrum of activities you can enjoy, because you can do everything from, you know, quite um, geopolitical risk analysis right through to working in a instant response role or in a SOC. So I think it's incredibly varied what you can do within the industry. And I think you only really 
get to meet people that can open open those opportunities to you by getting out in into the space and networking. I I personally found myself getting an internship while I was at university to be hugely valuable because I was able to um, try a, a real company and then um, get my full time position uh, that way. So I I would also recommend people uh, look very carefully at companies offering internships. And I know that certainly some of the firms I used to work for. Um, certainly offer um, internships in cybersecurity in in their areas so people get a sort of opportunity to try before they buy and now that gives people the chance to also get themselves a full-time job set up which i think in time of recession is quite a valuable thing to do i think the other thing i'd like to say is that it's not just about people from computer science or um university degree backgrounds i think it's also imperative to look at uh, apprenticeships if you're school age of course and also even if you come from liberal arts backgrounds, I've trained people in security in my prior roles when uh, training was a more direct responsibility I had. I've had people who've had like geography degrees, history degrees, who've gone on to be very successful security and privacy managers, both in consulting firms and in industry. So I think that, that the message I'd like to say is that regardless of your background, you can find a really rewarding and successful role in the industry, but you have to look past the kind of... Um, the usual stuff that says you have to have a hard computer science degree and be hardened in programming, etc. Now we do definitely need those people and there is a technical skills gap, of course, in those very specific skill sets, but I think it's the industry is open to anyone and I think it's open to people that have passion and enthusiasm to learn. And I would encourage anyone that has that to get stuck in. Probably one of the more difficult elements of um, retention in a pandemic, I think, is that people are joining without ever, ever having physically stepped foot in their office or having physically met any of their colleagues. And I think certainly for junior professionals, not having the support structures in terms of mentorship by being both with peers of your own age who are all going for the same life step and journey together, but also the oversight and experience of some of the more senior folks, not having that in person, I think is quite challenging to sort of get yourself introduced into the workforce. So we have seen some challenges there, but I think on a more positive side, which I think is what I'd like to highlight more of, to be honest, I think we can actually see a very interesting situation arising with the future of remote work and cyber security. So I think we've traditionally been very huge to the notion that you need to be based in an office or a SOC to do security work. I think we're going to see quite a large increase in the opening up of remote eligible roles in the security workforce. So I think we'll see, um, rather than if I take the UK as a specific example, because that's where I live and work, there's a, when I was a graduate years ago, the only option for me to get a good quality job as I perceived it at the time was to move to London. And you see a lot of people having to move to London and the South East. Now that's not necessarily the people place that people would like to grow. And this cost of living here is absolutely ridiculous and sky high and enormous and all sort of good things. But if we can have both at the junior levels and the more experienced levels, more consideration of remote working backed up by, of course, appropriate broadband and uh, kind of UK infrastructure to, to set that up as, a, as an important precondition, we can start to actually see potential for creating new high quality jobs in parts of the country that maybe have uh, felt the effects of deindustrialization over the last uh, 30 years. And I'd say the parallels for that also exist in many other European countries as well, who've had similar uh, journeys as the UK has. So if we can create new jobs, that are high skilled, well paid, well remunerated, interesting and challenging. I think that's, this can actually give um, some potential to change the way in which we think about where people do their work. So instead of having to be, you know, close to London so you can commute into an office five days a week, you just need to be near a train station or an airport to get to London maybe once every four to six weeks when you need to go in and have a, a meeting or a workshop with your team or um, stakeholders, what have you. I think that's going to be quite an interesting development in terms of how we think about where we do our work from. Now, I'm not saying that this means the end of the office, not, no, way, no way that's going to happen, but I think we, we view offices more as collaborative spaces where we come together to do work that's purposeful rather than just a bank, bank of desks that we trudge into every day to, to read emails and be on the phone. So my hope is that we'll see some really interesting um, opportunities to diversify the talent pool away from um, cities in London, London South East being example here or Paris and France or some of the major metropolitan centres in a place like Germany. 
in terms of attracting people, I think one of the things that I see a particular problem with in the industry is I think we need to look looking, we need to stop looking for unicorn job descriptions. Um, there's still too many entry level positions that expect someone to have years of experience, a raft of certifications and advanced degrees. And when I compare that to the entry level position criteria, it's almost like people just want to hire someone that can come in and do the job without any training. And I know that that's the ideal situation to be in, but the reality is we're not able to do that. But it's also locking people out of the industry. So I think we need to get a little bit more realistic about that um, on one hand. So that that's on the part of security hiring managers everywhere to do that. Um, but I think the other thing I'd like to see a little bit more of is we see it advancing here in the UK, but I think it's still work in progress in many European countries that I um, operate within. So I'd like to see us work much more closely with universities and schools to develop specific career paths into cybersecurity so that we understand the rules that are in play, the different types of educational requirements or job experience rules that are necessary to progress through the ranks so that people understand that, for example, if they're very technically minded and they want to go into instant response work and the idea of doing that and um, helping companies in crisis is something that really attracts them. They understand the specific career paths they need to go through, the certifications they need to obtain, and the experiences that we would expect to see at the various levels of their seniority journey to progress through, through the ranks and have a rewarding and successful career. And I think we need to have that for both university pathways, but also for non-university pathways, because I am very passionate about not just having uh, folks in the industry who have been to uh, red brick universities, although I admit to being uh, one of those types my, myself, but I think it's important that we try and cast on it a little bit further in terms of both the diversity of candidates from an educational background and also uh, female and ethnic diversity as well, which is something we have to improve upon within the industry. Um, I think I think the, um, the team at Accenture who um, rolled me onto that security project and were always very uh, an encouraging bunch. They taught, they taught me an absolute ton um, in my first couple of years in the industry, so I I think those guys really, and guys and gals really inspired me uh, to, to start with. So I, I find that was a really great kind of learning curve, and I, I felt very supported in do, in doing that. Um, I think the other person I would I would say was a recent professor um, at Oxford. So I, he supervised my Master of Science degree and my dissertation that I did a few years ago while I was working, and. Um, I found being supervised by somebody like him with his stature. So he was involved with um, Google to validate the security properties of the new TLS 1.3 protocol as it was being finalized and adopted. And I found being supervised by someone like that was really quite encouraging and very cool. And I, I remember going back to my to my colleagues where I was at EY at the time and saying, God, the guy supervising me, he, he's, he's literally helping to invent the new the new protocol that's going to help secure the internet. How cool is that? And and that was that was really awesome. Um, so I so I really enjoyed working with him. And he's not at Oxford anymore, but I but I um found uh, to be working with such people and being being uh, the beneficiary of their um guidance to be quite inspiring. Even though my master's degree is now largely tucked up in a foregone memory, so to speak. Thank you for listening to this InfoSecurity Europe podcast. 